The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. In this episode of Postcards... When we had that first sale, it was like the best feeling in the world. We it was like... so exciting. I think our first hat we sold for like $25. <laughs> and we were just like, yes! <laughs> This is it. I really enjoy owning the grocery store. It feels like you add a lot for, to the community. You can do different things, and um, they appreciate you being here. I like the fact that people can have, can come here and watch in the summertime, and then take a wine glass home. I think that's a wonderful thing. This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. Explore Alex.com. Easy to get to, hard to leave. Talented sisters Hannah Burks Hardmeyer and Maddie Wingeren from Fergus Falls bring fashion from the past back to life with their popular online company, Maddie's Millinery. My grandmother would taught, gave us sewing lessons to teach us how to sew, and um, I was probably like seven or eight, and I was kind of the child that couldn't sit still, you know, I was the one that had to, you know, be up and doing and having fun. So yeah, I totally enjoyed it, but um, we both did it at the same time and learned to sew under protest and under a lot of enjoyment. We have a younger sister who is significantly younger than we are, and um, she loved playing dress up, and I would always dress her up, and we'd do photo shoots and all this kind of stuff. And one day I realized that she didn't have any hats to go with her costumes or her dress up outfits, and I never had any hats to go with my dress up outfits, and I decided that my sister wasn't going to grow up with this same outrageous problem, so I made her a hat, which I actually have here. So this was the first hat I ever made. Underneath it is a Stratego box. And I used this old velvet shirt I got at a garage sale, and there's my robbing the feather duster. And uh, if you can see the back side, you can see how it's a uh, 15-year-old stitching. <laughs> but Gabby loved it, and it matched one of her dresses, and it goes on sort of like that. So. And then all of her little friends started coming over and seeing all the hats I was making for Gabby, and then they'd go home and tell their parents, Gabby has hats for her dress-up dre dresses, and we want them too. And so then their parents started saying, well, we'll pay you, Maddie, if you make our daughter's hats. And that's where it started. <laughs> so... March of 2006, a friend of ours came over and taught us like two hours how to do eBay. And that's where I came in because I've always been a more computer, I liked computers more than Maddie did. And um, we listed a few hats and we, it took a good month, I think, before we had a sale. So when we had that first sale, it was like the best feeling in the world. We it was were like, so exciting. I think our first hat we sold for like $25. <laughs> and we were just like, yes. <laughs> This is it. <laughs> After six months, we probably made about $250 worth of, you know, gross of sales. And we just realized that wasn't quite enough for two girls spending the amount of time that we were doing, even though to us it was a lot of money. So in August of 2006, Maddie looked at this pattern that we've had for a while with about 17 yards of fabric we found really cheap. Just like, today I'm going to make that Civil War dress we've been dreaming of creating. So she made the entire dress, she made a cape to go with it, and the hat to go with it too, all matching, all the same fabric, took pictures, listed online, two people wanted the same exact outfit, and that's where it hit us. Oh, 
brainwave. So we should do outfit. all outfits. Exactly. <laughs> so that was where it came from then. And now we're well over a thousand outfits sold into 17 different countries worldwide. So Maddie's Millinery and Costumes is the name of our business. And um, well, Maddie is my name. I'm named after my great grandmother. And um, she always wanted to be a millineress, which is the uh, art of old-fashioned hat making or art of hat making, basically. I mean, they used to have millinery shops in little villages all the time, and you'd go there and you'd buy, not only buy your hats, but you buy your accessories for your hats and things like that. And my grandmother always wanted to own one of these shops, um, but she never was able to. And so then when we were looking at a name and deciding we are going to sell hats, we thought, well, millinery would be perfect. And basically, Maddie's millinery sounds better than Hannah's haberdashery. <laughs> yeah, because we kept getting people asking all the time, Hannah, why isn't your name in the business? You do just as much as Maddie does. I'm like, well, Maddie sounded better with millinery. <laughs> and nobody knows what haberdashery means. So. Exactly. We do everything from the Dark Ages, so like the 1100s. I mean, we've, we've done even before that into the Grecian times, Roman times, all the way into 1950s, 1960s even. So it's a wide range of um, time span. We recently had some of our work displayed at the Cadets Gallery, um, and we had a little opening gala event. Um, it was very, very nice, very pleasant. Uh, people in Fergus are really friendly, so... It was just nice to be able to share with our community more of what we do, and it's fun watching little kids walk by the windows pointing, going, look at that, it's a dress the size of three people. <laughs> Tonight at the Center for the Arts, we'll be doing a Downton Abbey premiere. We'll be helping in the beginning portion of it, doing a little bit of a fashion show, fashion talk about some of the eras that are spanned throughout the four seasons of the show. We'll also be fully dressed. I'll be wearing a actual 1920s vintage gown. Um, so it's almost 100 years old. And then Maddie will be wearing a, actually a recreation from the show, um, season one or two. Season one. Yep. Season one. I'll be wearing a Lady Sybil's pantaloon outfit that I recreated because mm -hmm. I just thought it was fun. <laughs> yeah. And the really nice thing is a lot of times our costumes go out all over the world where very little actually happens here in our own hometown. So it's nice that there's getting a little bit more activities that one can dress up for or one can actually enjoy and appreciate what historical costuming does because it really is just a gorgeous insight into history itself and like what people actually lived like. It's amazing how much can be seen by just looking and examining what they wear. So it's really fun to have something in our backyard like this just happening here. I think there was a time in our life where I think we were about 12, 13. There's 18 months apart between us, so we've always pretty much been best buds all throughout, playing outside, and Maddie was always the princess, and you know, <laughs> I always had stuff <laughs> played. Um, but then I think we're about that pre-teen age, age where we were really just getting into a lot of bickering and fights, and mom just sat us down one time and was like, girls, you guys need to be like, you could be your best friends if you would take the time and effort to just grow your relationship. And from that point on, I mean, it was like, we really did become best friends after that, even mm -hmm. more so than we ever had before. And yep. I love, we love working together. Yeah, we it's... really do. Have you missed a show you'd like to see? Pioneer On Demand has all of your favorite productions available to watch online at your convenience, including past episodes of Postcards. Find out why the town of Clinton is rallying to save their beloved Bonnie's hometown grocery store. Well, I was managing a restaurant bar type thing and um, wasn't enjoying that much. And actually, I was homesick one day from work and the owner of the bank came to my house and asked if I'd be interested in taking over the grocery store. So I thought, why not try it and see what happens? And I'm still here. <laughs> I really enjoy owning the grocery store. It feels like you add a lot to the community. You can do different things and um, 
They appreciate you being here. You just can't afford to lose any more businesses in town. There's just an epidemic of small rural grocery stores are being shuttered all over uh, Minnesota and throughout this entire, you know, upper Great Plains area. And so we're just very grateful that we have Bonnie's here on Main Street because having a grocery store in a small town like this, this is really um, a big part of having a healthy, vital community. This is really part of the lifeblood of a, uh, a, a good quality of life in, in rural America. The USDA in the last couple of years has come out with what they call uh, food deserts. These could be either urban or rural places. Uh, they're places where the people who live there have limited access to food. And uh, northern part of Big Stone County, where Bonnie's Grocery Store is located, is a USDA designated rural food desert. Uh, I take some issue with that because Bonnie's really does help provide a lot of healthy food that's very accessible uh, to our community. And if we lost this grocery store, that would really, truly make us a rural food desert. Pretty much we know every, if we don't know somebody, they just moved to town or something of that fact. Because yeah, we know everybody that comes in. Sometimes it's hard, <laughs> you know, because we have a lot of surprise parties that people order things for and stuff. We got to learn just to, you know, be quiet sometimes. We know who's sick, you know who's, yeah, it, it, it's funny because everybody knows everybody in town. And if you don't see somebody, you call to make sure they're okay. Or make sure, We've had that happen quite a few times. I don't think any, any time that I've come in here that you don't stop in an aisle and visit with somebody. How are you doing and how are your kids doing and how are your grandkids doing? What's the football game? How is that coming out? And you're going to go to the musical at school tonight? You know, you visit. You see them in church and you see them at Monty's. Look at away from me. I always sure, aspire to you. bring all my bags and you actually do. I bring almost every week. Hey, hey, you're good. You're good. If you see somebody in who's a stranger, it's only once that they'll be a stranger because after that they're your friend or you'll know them and greet them. Bonnie's is a very big asset. She knows when there's specials coming up and if I'm going to be ordering from her, say the boxed potato mixes, she gives me the special price, which is really nice. We're giving Bonnie the business, but we're also being able to utilize those donated dollars in a, in a better way. So yeah, she's, she's very giving and thoughtful. Just a couple years ago, I found out I'm gluten free. And I thought, oh my, and I've come down here and start my shopping to see what Bonnie could do for me. In this small town, I wasn't sure. And I knew I wanted some flour because I love to bake. And I had tried using some flours, mixing them all together myself with not much success. And then my one daughter from the cities came out with this brand of Namaste flour, and that was it. So I said to Bonnie, do you suppose you could get that for me? She says, well, I'm sure gonna try. Well, that was just the start of all the things that she's done. Bonnie's is really important to me and my family. I sometimes joke that I have like a personal grocer, which is a completely new experience. Um, Bonnie's is where we get all of our staples, all of our groceries. I can call up Bonnie when she has ads and specials and we order off of the uh, circular that comes out every week in the newspaper and we just have a personal grocer and it's just an amazing uh, and wonderful basically service to a lot of the families in our area. We make enough money in here maybe to stock, keep the stores stocked and hopefully pay your utilities and your employees. It doesn't really give you a lot of leeway for repairs and different things like that. So. And you always got to update things. We had to put a new grinder. We had to do floors. You got to keep the NSF things with the um, Department of Health and stuff. So it's really a struggle, and I can for small stores to do all those things. This is an important part of the whole local foods movement. This is really a cornerstone in helping provide healthy food to people in food deserts. An investment in Bonnie's and this. Uh, energy efficient freezer project is an investment in having a healthy main street and a healthy community for another generation or two. I think we'll save quite a bit. They were talking like 38% of my bill so I'm hoping it should you know benefit me in the long run because that, that's about the only freezer that I have not replaced yet in this store. We've, re we've done all our compressors and, and units and things in here except for the big ones. That's really a spendy freezer for me so 
It's important to me, I guess, because I feel like I'm a big part of the community since I started with the store, and I think the people in town would be lost without it. I don't make much money in here, but I enjoy what I do when I live in town, and I can just come to work, and I, I, I like what it does for the community, I guess. Food is one of those things that binds us together, and so this is just a uh, wonderful addition that I can't imagine our town would be the same place without Bonnie's hometown grocery. So we're we're just very happy that we have this. There you go. Thanks. Have a good day. Do you use Facebook, Twitter, or other social media? Connect with us to get immediate access to behind the scenes videos, reviews, and other postcards and pioneer news. We visit Vining, Minnesota, where glass artist John Olison shapes spectacular art objects with fire. I'm going to make is a bowl similar to this. Um, it's going to be green instead of purple. And the colors will start out, it, well, already there's a chunk of color like this. This is a transparent green. This would look, when it's cold, just like this purple. Um, all the transparent colors are almost black in the way they look. And the opaque colors are the color they look like. So I have two chunks heating up in the annealer to 950 degrees. And I'm going to put a small chunk of transparent green on the end of the blowpipe. And smooth that out, melt it to the blowpipe, and then I'm going to pick up a small piece of opal green. My name is John Olison. I'm a glass artist in the vining area of west central Minnesota. The uh, blowpipe needs to be hot enough that the uh, glass will stick to it. There's just a little bit of leftover glass on the end of it, so when I pick up the color here, it'll stick to it. And by preheating it to 950 degrees, it prevents the thermal shock from uh, breaking the piece, from it causing it to explode. By putting the color on the end of the blowpipe like this, it lets, us, lets me encase it in clear, and then when I blow through the blowpipe, the bubble goes through the color first. So it gives the effect of a, like that purple bowl isn't solid purple. It's just a very thin layer of purple on the inside. The appeal of glass is just in that it's the nature of it, how it behaves, that you can go from that honey, that molten glass that's almost like honey to something that gets solid right in front of your eyes, um, that takes on color, that the color is orange until it starts to cool and then it will show blue or green or whatever it is. Um, and just that, that function of heat, it's sort of the attraction of blacksmithing and things like that too, where you're, you're shaping something with fire. I find glass a fascinating material to work with and even watch. I can watch glass blowing for hours. Well, to, to shape the glass, it's either it's done through um, reheating it and doing some specific reheating. I can either I can heat the bottom and swing it a little bit to cause it to lengthen. I can keep it on a parallel to the ground and blow into it and just expand it from the inside and do almost like a balloon. Um, so by specific heating and then gravity and various tools, wet newspaper, wooden sticks, carbon rods, things like that, it's, it's pretty easy to shape. It's, uh, it doesn't, there isn't much resistance to it when it's very hot. It's easy to, to move and shape, but then when it cools, it holds that shape very well. The furnace rarely gets below 2,000 degrees, um, and it requires 2450 to melt uh, glass from the raw materials. And now 
going to put the lines or the vines on the outside. This bowl is called a vine bowl, and this is this design part is why it gets that name. The process of glass blowing, as I do it here, is involved with having a furnace full of molten glass all the time and retrieving that glass on the end of a blowpipe or a punty and then forming it while it's hot. Um, and as we saw with the bowl that I can apply colors to give it the look of being a solid color or spots of colors. Being a, a sole artist, a single glass blower, I don't have a team of people, I don't have employees. Um, I am, I wear many hats every day. Okay, now we'll add the foot to it. A lot of people have said they can pick my work out as being very organic, very um, fluid. Uh, the stems of my wine glasses, the bowls like we saw earlier, um, have a fluid, organic feel to them. Um, I would say that is what defines my work. I most enjoy when people will come back and be, uh, when they're a repeat customer, when they've picked up two wine glasses on a previous visit or through a shop somewheres and we'll come here and get a few more because they enjoy using them. I'm gonna punty the piece now, which is transferring it from this blowpipe to a solid uh, steel rod. And we'll finish it off. I'll go right past you. I think glass is a very interesting material in that you have that window um, in there where it's plastic enough to blow into it, to expand it, to uh, pull it out into vines like I applied to the bowl, um, show that plasticity and that, that workability of glass. And it also has the immediacy of being done. It, 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 solidifies in front of you so you know what you have while you're making it. Yep, just like that. So I have to put it away before it cracks or anything, but that's what it looks like. It will change the color a little bit as it cools, but not much. All the pieces I make in my studio have a stamp on the punty mark, which is the logo for the studio, White Pine Studios. I like the fact that people can have, can come here and watch in the summertime and then take a wine glass home use it and have that story of watching one be made or you know knowing who made it i think that's a wonderful thing visit pioneer.org for more information on postcards and other pioneer productions pioneer on demand has all of your favorite productions available to watch online at your convenience including past episodes of postcards Mountains for my eyes. I 
This program on Pioneer Public Television is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Juline in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. The Arrowwood Resort and Conference Center. Your ideal choice for Minnesota resorts offering luxury townhomes, 18 holes of golf, Darling Reflection Spa, Big Splash Water Park, and much more. Alexandria, Minnesota, a relaxing vacation or great location for an event. ExploreAlex.com, easy to get to, hard to leave. <laughs> 